Let's go ahead. So hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining for what is the very last session of the Tour de France from A to Z. So first, I want to thank you uh, if you attended all of them, even if you attended uh, one or a few of them all along. I really appreciate it. And I have uh, some of you contacted me to give you to give me your feedback. And thank you very much to support this project. I really appreciate so like yeah, this session, once again, will be recorded and uh, uploaded on the YouTube channel in just a few days. So you will be able to rewatch them again as much as, you li as you'd like. So let's start for today's journey. So today we're going to Xantrai, Ifignac, and Zonza. So I'll be completely honest, I use those three uh, small towns as uh, pure excuses to talk about their broader areas. Uh, it was a bit difficult for the end of the alphabet to find uh, big cities or like, yeah, <laughs> big, big cities that I could tell you like thoroughly about. So like, yeah, these ones are mainly excuses to, to talk more about uh, other regions of France. So let's start with Xantrai, so located in the uh, Lot-et-Garonne department. So um, the Lot-et-Garonne is located about here. And so it's quite a rural area. So as you can see, it's actually midway between Bordeaux over here and Toulouse located about over there. So the whole area uh, between those two big cities is quite... Um, like yeah, it's there's not much people who live around there, but still like it's a very uh, like yeah, it's a very nice area to visit because there are lots of small, very cute villages and the nature is quite incredible over there. So like yeah, it's still worth going there. Um, so like yeah, the Lot et Garonne is crossed by two main rivers, the Lot and the Garonne, which gives the department its name as you can guess, but there are way more rivers than that uh, in the Lot-et-Garonne where Xantrai is located. So like yeah, uh, for this city, I'm going to talk about like yeah, this broader area. So Lot-et-Garonne, but also Dordogne, Lot, and like, yeah, some other uh, places over there. So to give you an idea, so yeah, the biggest city in Lot-et-Garonne is actually Agen and has about 33,000 inhabitants. So like, yeah, even if, as you can see, even the biggest city doesn't have that many inhabitants. So that gives you an idea of how uh, less populated this area is. But what's interesting about this area is that there were 42 bastides, which are fortified towns that were built in the area uh, in the 13th and 14th centuries. So starting today's journey up, let's see, it's taking a bit of time to appear. Up. All right, so one of them, uh, one of those best seeds is actually Montflanquin, which is labeled uh, prettiest vill in French village. Uh, since 1989. So the, this Bastille was founded in 1256 by Alphonse de Poitiers, which was, uh, who was King St. Louis' brother. And so the Bastille of Montflanquin is actually one of the best preserved Bastille in the area still to this date. So if you go over there and you want to learn more about the constructions uh, of the Bastille in the area, in the area, you can go to the Bastille Museum in Montflanquin. Um, so like yeah, you will learn more about uh, those kind of fortifications in the southwest of France uh, through exhibits, activities, uh, as well as models. And if you climb all the way up to the hill, uh, you will go and you will arrive at Cap del Peche Square, which is about uh, 600 feet high and from where you will have a very nice view over the countryside and the Biron Castle, which I'm going to tell you more about right now. So yeah, let's go there. So the Biron Castle is one of the biggest castles of the southwest of France. Uh, so it's located about 20 minutes away from Montflanquin. This one um, is actually <clears throat> located in Dordogne. So another department, but still in the southwest of France. This castle, uh, so its construction started around year 1000. 
And as you can see from the picture, it has quite different architectural styles. So from uh, medieval uh, with uh, 12th century keep, uh, there's, it's like, yeah, it has a Renaissance style as well uh, with a chapel. You can see inside some vaulted kitchens from the Renaissance as well, as well as the living quarters and the remains of some frescoes from the 16th century. And the last part of the castle was built in the 18th century. So like, yeah, once again, a quite different style, more classical and actually quite modern. So this castle uh, was actually used as a decor for some movies, some French movies, such as Jacques Le Croquant, uh, directed in 2007, Revenge of the Musketeers in 1994, and Brotherhood of the Wolf. Uh, and I know that for the latter, we have the DVD at the Princeton Public Library. So if you want to see the Biron Castle in a movie, uh, you can check this one out. Uh, so this castle is uh, labeled historical monument since 1928. Then we can go back to the Lotte Garonne, to the south part of that department and go to Nerac which is a medieval and Renaissance, Renaissance town. So it's actually where King Henri of Navarre, before he was uh, King Henry IV uh, and King of France, held his court. So um, that king actually lived for about uh, 10 years in uh, Nera Castle where, as I just said, he has uh, he had his court. So Nerac's castle was actually built in the 14th century and was embellished in the 15th century. It was massively damaged after Henri IV's death, death uh, and as well during the French Revolution, and it's been massively restored in the 12th, 20th century, but nowadays only the North A remains. This castle uh, now hosts the Municipal Museum, where you can find some exhibitions about the life of Henry, Henry IV and his family, and about the Art de Vivre, during the Renaissance. Uh, then you can just take a small bridge and stroll in the Garenne Royal Park, uh, a park that was created in the 16th century and then embellished by Queen Margot, who was King Henry IV, Henry IV's um, wife. And so she embellished the uh, park with a 3000 steps alley. Uh, and so in this park, you can find as well some fountains and statues, statues. And this park was actually labeled historical site in 1909. And if you want, so you can uh, actually take a small uh, a cruise on the, the Baez River that you can see on that picture. Uh, there aboard the specific boat, the Prince Henry's Co, which is a flat bottom boat, all by renting your own little boat. So this is a view of the what remains of the castle today. And then if you take your car and drive a bit further away, this time in lots so more in the east than the previous sites, you can go to the Padirac Chasm. So uh, this uh, chasm was created by natural er erosion hundreds of thousands of years ago, and probably more, it's actually quite difficult for scientists to exactly date when this chasm was actually created. And so it was discovered by speleologist Edouard Alfred Martel in 1899. So he discovered uh, and mapped a lot of galleries, as well as some uh, speleologists who came later, but still there are quite a few galleries and some part of the uh, underground uh, chambers that haven't been explored yet. So if you go there, I advise you to take a jumper with you because it's quite fresh inside. So the year-round temperature, the air, uh, year-round temper air temperature, sorry, is about 55 Fahrenheit degrees and the water temperature is 54 uh, Fahrenheit degrees. So uh, yeah, try to avoid not to like, yeah, try to avoid uh, falling into the rivers. So I just mentioned it. So there's actually a river that runs uh, about 100 uh, meters, so 300 feet below the surface. 
It's called the Underground River. And this one uh, runs through many chambers and lakes. Uh, so some parts of the chasm are accessible by foot. So you can go all the way down, take an elevator, and then, uh, so yeah, stroll in the, down the, the chasm. You can even take a boat trip uh, on a part of the Plain River for about one kilometer. Uh, so like yeah, that's 0 0.6 miles. And so taking uh, this boat tour will uh, give you access to some galleries and lakes, such as the Rain Lake, where you will find an ensemble of stalactites and stalactites um, that are about 60 meters, 200 feet long. And they are called the Great Chandeliers as it's suspended mid-air. Uh, further, uh, further down on the promenade, you can uh, discover the upper lake. Uh, so this one is actually suspended 20 meters above the river. And over there, you can find an ensemble of stalagmite this time, so that goes up, called the pile of plates. Um, and they are called like that because they actually look like uh, stacked up China, as you can, as you will see just after. Uh, and so the Padira chasm is actually the most visited underground site in France, as it welcomes more than 400,000 visitors per year. So this is a view of the upper lake and, um, <clears throat> and the pile of plates. So like, yeah, as you can see, like, it really gives you the impression that there are a lot of like uh, stacked up plates one above the other. So like, yeah, it's really funny how the erosion works over there. And so, yeah, I gave you a little bonus as well. So if you want to try to find me, I'm actually over there. So I don't remember, but it seems that I went to the Padira chasm when I was, I guess, uh, maybe six, seven years old. And so even if I don't remember actually going there, I've heard that story so many times that it's as if I had memories of it. And apparently my sister over here, uh, was unbearable that day and didn't listen to the uh, the advice of the guide who told us to like not to move, not to stand, not to like uh, yeah, not to move too much to avoid tipping the boat. What did she do? The exact opposite. So yeah, she was not very like yeah. <laughs> it was hard to to for her to follow the rules that day but yeah i guess we still had a good time as i said i don't really remember but yeah i i hope that i will go back there one day all right so even if uh this area is like there are not that many people who live over there there are quite a few festivals uh including the international festival of journalism uh, so this one happened one weekend in July in couture sur garonne And so uh, this festival, its aim is to create dialogue between international, national, and local media as uh, with uh, citizens. So different themes are uh, chosen each year. So from health, technology, international politics, or sports, and some talks, writing workshops, debates are organized, but also concerts, exhibitions, and movie screenings related to the different themes. Uh, you can also uh, check out Garouac, which is a big eclectic music festival uh, that happens one weekend in late June, early July, in Marmande, uh, in the north of lot et uh, Over there, you could see French and international singers and bands performing. Uh, the Marmande Lyrical Nights uh, happens one weekend uh, at the end of August. Uh, it's an opera uh, festival where you can see some concerts, recitals, as well as movie screenings, uh, with an and as well attend an international singing contest for young professionals. And if you want to try something quite fun, you can go to the Montflanquin Medieval Celebrations. Uh, and so this one is happening actually right now, so mid-August for one weekend as well. So over there, you can see some shows with like troubadours, minstrels, as well as parades uh, in medieval costumes, uh, as well as jousts. All right. 
So when it comes to food in the southwest of France, uh, duck is very, very popular. So there are quite a few uh, specialty dishes uh, that imply uh, the use of duck meat, starting uh, with the magret canard, which is basically a duck breast fillet, quite thin. Um, and so, yeah, it's a technique to prepare the meat coin uh, in the late 1950s by chef André Dagain and Vincent Magret. So like, yeah, it's, I think my favorite way to, to have duck because so like, yeah, the meat has to be um, not rare, but almost like, yeah, it has to be a bit bloody to, to be best appreciated. The second one is foie gras. You may have heard about this one. It's one of the most emblematic uh, delicacies of French cuisine. So this specialty food is uh, made of the liver of a duck or goose obtained by force feeding. Uh, so the southwest of France produces most of the foie gras in the country, and it can be prepared and eaten cold or warm. I've actually never tried it warm, but I'd like to try. I guess the taste may, must be quite different. And so, yeah, as you may know, France is the main producer and consumer of foie gras in the world. And it produced more than 14,000 uh, tons of foie gras in uh, 2020. Uh, confit de canard, so the confit. So this time the duck meat is uh, salt, cure, uh, salt cured, sorry, then uh, cooked in its own fat at low temperature from uh, four hours up to 10 hours. So the confit can actually be kept up to six months in the fridge in a sealed container as the cooking fat and fat acts as a preservative. Uh, so that's a reason why it can uh, also be um, sold in cans. So for those three uh, dishes, so the um, like yeah, the three uh, dishes implied um, the force feeding of the goose or the duck. And you can end the meal by a croustade, which is a common dessert in the southwest of France. And it's made with tube of pastries filled with fruits. In that region, um, prunes will be uh, the most common, I would say. And uh, the fruits can be macerated in Armagnac. You're going to ask me, but what is Armagnac? So Armagnac is a brandy produced in several areas in the southwest. So lot of garonne land uh, in like close to the ocean and Gers um, in the south of Lotte-Garonne. You can have an idea uh, with the map on the right of the screen. Uh, so Armagnac is obtained, um, uh, so like it's distilled from wine and aged in oak barrels. So the grape varieties and the distillation process uh, used differ from cognac, but they are both brandy. Uh, Armagnac is usually produced and sold by small producers and is less well known outside of France than cognac that is produced by uh, big, um, big companies. So when it comes to wine, there are four main vineyard areas in Lotte-Garonne. Um, so these vineyards are part of the larger um, southwest production of France, but it was like, yeah, this area is so big that it was a bit complicated to find the time to talk about the whole Southwest region as a whole. So I'm just wanted to focus more uh, on the Lotte Garonne area. So like, yeah, the four uh, production areas are Côte de Duras in the north, in purple, Côte, de, Côte du Marmandais, just south of this, uh, of the Côte de Jura, Buzet, and Côte du Brulois. So, <clears throat> To give you an idea, like yeah, mainly red wines uh, as well as, as rosé are produced in this uh, region. Uh, white wine is still produced, but in lower quantity, except in the Côte du Jura, uh, which produces more white wine than the three other ones. So to give you an idea, the four of those one vineyards together uh, produce 37 million uh, bottles per year.
Second stop, so we went all the way from the southwest of France to the north coast of Brittany. So I know that I've already talked to you about Brittany uh, in a past session, but I told you more about uh, this part over here, so the south coast. But today I'm going to tell you more about the north coast. So the landscapes are a bit different, the atmosphere is a bit different, and there are uh, a lot of things to see throughout uh, Brittany. So I thought, why not? So as I said, Ifignac is located on the north, north coast of Brittany on the Saint-Brieuc Bay. Uh, so it used to be a port town in uh, Roman, Roman Gaul, so Ifignac itself. So it uh, was a port town uh, between the first century BC and the fifth century AD. And so Ifignac Cove is actually part of a national natural reserve that I will tell you more about a bit later. And Saint-Brieuc has actually the second largest bay in France, right after the Mont Saint-Michel, which is located not that far away from that part of Brittany. So if you want to take a, to take your car, I guess it must be like a maybe two hour drive from that area. Unfortunately, I didn't have the time to tell you more about the Mont Saint-Michel, but it's definitely on my list of places to see in France. All right, so to continue the visit of North Brittany. So let's go to Saint-Brieuc. So you know now that I'm completely obsessed with half-timbered houses, and you will definitely find some in Saint-Brieuc city center, uh, uh, which is full of medieval stone uh, and half-timbered houses, uh, some dating from the 15th to the 17th century. If you continue your stroll to the city center of Saint-Brieuc, you will uh, get to the Saint-Étienne Cathedral, which is one of the rare fortified Gothic cathedrals to remain. And this one was built between the 12th and 15th centuries. Uh, it was damaged several times uh, in between, as well as after the 12th and the 15th century. But like yeah, what, we, what you will be able to see, well, actually I can show you right now. So yeah, that you can see over here that yeah, it's quite rare for a church to have this kind of architecture. So the fortification dates more from the 15th century. Uh, so if you continue your stroll north of uh, the city of Saint-Brieuc, you will get to the port of Legay, which is a uh, yachting port and the entry point of the Saint-Brieuc Bay. Uh, so the port of Legay hosts the Grand Légion, a sailing vessel that was built following uh, models from the 19th century, but it was built uh, in the last couple of decades. So the Pointe du Roselier, still a bit after the port of Legay, if you want to take a, to continue your stroll for a bit longer hike, uh, you can walk for about one hour, one hour and 15 minutes to the Pointe du Roselier, where you will have a 360 degree view over the Saint-Brieuc Bay uh, down to the Ifignac Cove. <clears throat> and so as I was mentioning before, so there is a natural reserve uh, in the Bay Area. So this one is actually the largest uh, of the natural reserves in Brittany. Uh, it, there are about 30,000 to 40,000 birds that come here uh, every winter. Uh, flocking over a wide variety of landscapes, which make it a unique e ecosystem, like foreshore, salt meadows, dunes, mussel swarm, uh, and is the habitat of more than 2,000 species of animals. So like, yeah, here you can have a view of the natural reserve and the, uh, I guess, it must be a species of goose that is flying and working in the area. Uh, then on the list, we have the Plua Cliffs. So Plua is the uh, tallest cliff that you can find in Brittany. It culminates at uh, 341 feet high. And so Plua, so the village of Plua and its coast is the culminating point of an eight mile uh, stretch of rocky coast. Over there, you can have a great view over the Bay of Saint-Brieuc again. So uh, if you stroll along uh, the beach of the beaches of Pluha, 
uh, you can find Bega Stealth, uh, where you can find the remains of a gun bunker, which used, uh, which used to house two guns and was built to protect a small anchorage. If you continue your stroll uh, after, the, after the tip, you can go to Gwynzegel Beach, uh, where you will see uh, trunks that jut out of the water. And uh, this is actually a very old way of anchorage for boats that was used in this area uh, as early as the 5th century. And so this is one of the last of its kind that's still in use. Like yeah, this kind of anchorage is one of the few examples that remains in France. So basically the boats are tethered to the trunks by ropes and chains. So like, yeah, that's uh, how they anchor in, in that beach. Further away, uh, you can uh, go to the Bonaparte beach. Uh, <clears throat> which played an important role in World War II and has been listed as one of, the, of France's most important sites for resistance activities. So during eight separate operations from January to August 1944, 135 British, Canadian, and American airmen and agents were secretly evacuated from this beach by boat to the UK. And to finish your exploration of the Plua Cliffs in this area, uh, you can go a bit more inland and check Kermaria and Iskuit uh, Chapel, which means uh, Chapel of Death uh, in Breton. Um, so this one is located west of Plua village, and it's renowned for its rare 15th century mural depicting a dance macabre. Uh, made of 47 images ranging from bishops to uh, men to noble people, just like dancing with a skeleton that represents death. So that's uh, what you can see over here. And then you can visit the village of Quintin, uh, which is labeled Petite Cité de Caractère, so small town with character. Um, so you've heard me mentioning uh, another label in the previous sessions, uh, the prestigious village of France. So those two labels, labels are a bit different. Um, so the Petite Cité de Caractère is uh, a label given to small towns with a remarkable heritage and wishing to make this heritage the foundation of their development projects. Whereas the prestigious village of France uh, focuses more on the harmony of the architectural ensemble uh, of a village. So Quintin hosts a castle, uh, which, uh, whose architectural ensemble uh, dates from the 15th, the 17th, and the 18th century. So you can find an archive tower that was actually built between the 13th and the 18th century, some ramparts and two castles one from the 17th century and the other from the 18th century, as well as French gardens. So you can uh, visit the ground floor of the 18th century and visit the interiors uh, to know, uh, to discover these spaces and know how they were decorated already at that, uh, at that point of uh, history. Uh, so you can visit the dining room where you can actually have a candlelit dinner during summer the living rooms, the library, as well as the bedroom and the kitchen uh, that has the last granite stove in France. Uh, there's as well a permanent exhibition on tableware and table manners. So these apartments were actually decorated with are actually decorated with furniture and arts from the 16th century. And so the town itself. Uh, used to be the main commercial center for the Bretagne, fab for the Bretagne fabric factory between 1650 uh, to 1830. So um, Bretagne fabric is actually a uh, linen kind of uh, cloth. Uh, so there's a factory and a workshops uh, and a workshop that are open to visit. If you want to learn more about uh, linen as a plant and also how to weave it, and the abundance uh, of the plant for the history of Brittany and that tradition uh, um, of uh, weaving linen in Brittany. 
And to finish with uh, Ifiniac, we can go to Brea Island, uh, which is located 10 minutes of the coast by boat, so roughly one mile away from, uh, from the shore of Brittany. So uh, Brea Islands are actually uh, composed of a small main ensemble, which is like yeah, two by one mile, as well as uh, 86 islets. So the main um, island is actually composed by two islands connected by a bridge. And it's a very popular destination as it attracts more than 400,000 tourists per year. Uh, and actually it's so popular that the municipality had to cap the number of tourists at 4,700 uh, a day on weekdays during the high season as it tends to be overcrowded during summer. Uh, it's possible to tour it from the sea on a sailing boat to spot unspoiled little coves, the, the lighthouse at the North Tip, and the port from where sailors left to Newfoundland. So it's important to know that you can't actually uh, take your car to go to Brea Island. You can only walk or cycle on the island. Because as you can see, it's quite tiny. So if 4,000 people came with their car, nobody could actually drive. So like it's actually safer for everybody to just walk or cycle on Brea Island. And you can uh, just yeah use the five trails that you can find across the island. So on the <clears throat> uh, south island, you will find actually the village with its lively square, uh, the privateer houses and 16th century church. Uh, and in the north part of the island, you will see the purple moors and stone walls that give a kind of feeling of Ireland. So you know that uh, people in Brittany like to party. So like in that part of Brittany as well, there are quite a few festivals that you can attend, starting with the Scallop Festival uh, across several port towns like Erquis, Pimpol, Cinque, Portrieux. So those three cities actually alternately organize celebrations around the shell, uh, easily found in the area. So this festival happens one weekend in April and you can see how fishermen catch scallops. Uh, you can buy some on the markets. Uh, you can try them during food tasting events and you can listen to music uh, at some concerts. So like it's quite a, a festive moment. Uh, Art Rock Festival uh, happens in Saint-Brieuc one weekend late May, and it's a multidisciplinary festival with music, visual and fine arts, performing arts as well, uh, and dance, and even more, uh, even more kind of uh, performances. The Rampart Festival happens uh, every other year on odd years, one weekend in July in Dinan, so uh, another uh, city uh, this time in the west of, in the east of San Bayou, sorry. So over there, you will uh, be able to attend joosting tournaments, a big medieval market, as well as balls in uh, medieval costumes, a grand parade, and many other events that bring ancient customs to life and take you back to uh, the medieval era. And during the Sangu festival that happens in Gargan for five days in August, uh, so you will be able to attend some uh, Celtic music concerts and as well uh, Breton traditional uh, dance performances. Uh, there's an actual uh, dance championship, so and as well as parades in traditional Breton costumes. So like if you want to cheer professional Breton dancers, go ahead. Uh, there are as well shows in the street. So in total, there are more than 2,000 musicians and dancers that come every year uh, to perform at that festival. So I already told you uh, about the main uh, dishes that you can eat in Brittany, but there's one that I kept for today. Uh, so in the Bay of Saint-Brieuc, you can actually find this uh, site of the biggest natural accumulation of scallops in France. Uh, so like over 580 square miles. So my question of the day for you is uh, what quantity of scallops is fished each year in the bay in terms of tons? Thousands of tons, I would say. 
If you have an idea, you can write it in the chat or unmute yourself. Then, so a tiny bit less than 10,000. So actually, on average, it's 6,000 tons uh, that are fish per year. Um, the year 2021, 2022 was actually quite good because there were more than uh, 1,800. Uh, so yeah, more than 8,000 tons fished uh, that year. And so the entire production of scallops in, uh, in Saint-Brieuc Bay represents more than half of the entire French production of scallops. So like, yeah, this is the biggest uh, site to um, fish scallops in France. So the season to fish scallops is actually from October 1st to May the 15th. And uh, I was in Maine last weekend, so I've heard that there is a minimum size uh, of lobster to be actually sold on the market. So it's the same with scallop. So the scallops have to uh, be at least 10.2 centimeters, so four inches to be uh, commercialized uh, on the market. So fishermen uh, in the area and usually in, uh, and in France as a whole uh, can use two techniques, either drag nets or diving. So now let's go to Corsica. So we haven't had the opportunity to tell you more about this part of, the, of France yet, but this was the last one, so let's go for it. Uh, so Zonza uh, itself is a village located in the mountains in the south part of Corsica. Uh, so Corsica uh, has been French uh, since 1796. Before that, um, it used to belong to, um, it was dominated, dominated sorry, by the Genoese uh, Republic and uh, was briefly independent uh, between the moment the Genoese uh, lost control of the area and French took over. So uh, Corsica is about 180 kilometers long, so 120 miles long, and 50 miles are the largest and it's the biggest island of mainland France. And it's nicknamed the Island of Beauty, so I think it's a beautiful way to uh, finish this session. So Corsica is actually the native island of Napoleon Bonaparte. So he left uh, quite a few marks on the island and is still celebrated over there today. And Corsica has actually hit uh, its own flag. So it's, um, I don't have a picture, but basically it's uh, uh, the face of a moor uh, in, in black with uh, a white um, kind of, um, yeah, kind of white scarf uh, over the forehead. So starting to talk about Corsica with Ajaccio, uh, which is the biggest city of Corsica with uh, about 70,000 inhabitants. And that's actually where uh, Napoleon was, was born, hence its nickname, the Imperial City. So Ajaccio um, <clears throat> so was actually the first French city to be li liberated during World War II on September 9th, 1943. And that city developed around the Mulis Citadel, uh, built between 1492 and the 18th century. So it was uh, built first by the Genoese in order to protect the city uh, effectively from marine, uh, maritime attacks. Um, but then its vocation changed in the 19th century and became less and less defensive, and it gradually became a military barracks uh, when um, it belonged to uh, France. It was occupied by the Italian fascists during the Second World War and served as a prison. Um, if you want to know more about the history of the story of Napoleon, you can actually uh, visit the Maison Bonaparte, uh, which is a museum focused on the Bonaparte family, so Napoleon, but also his parents and his heirs, uh, such as Napoleon III and uh, Imperatrice uh, Eugenie. 
so over there, you will actually see furniture, paintings, and decorations that take you uh, back to the atmosphere of the 18th century. And so the house itself is uh, listed as a historical monument. Uh, then a bit away from Ajaccio, so you can uh, drive or take a hike to the Parata Peninsula, which is located 7.5 miles away from Ajaccio. Uh, and so you, from Ajaccio, you have to take the uh, bloodthirsty route. Uh, it seems quite scary, but it's actually more related to the colors of the sky that you can see on the picture as well as the color of the rocks that you can see on the uh, Parata points. So the Parata tower uh, that you can see on the picture over here was built in 1550, 1551 uh, by the Genoese. And it's a great spot to catch the sunset as you can see again from the picture. <clears throat> so away uh, from uh, the the tip over there, you can actually take a boat to go to the um, <clears throat> bloodthirsty islands, which are composed of uh, four islets of red porphyry, accessible by uh, only accessible by boat in summer. Uh, the main island, uh, Mezumare, is the habitat of more than 150 plant species, uh, some that grow only there, as well as many birds, uh, like different species of seagulls. Then uh, you can go all the way south of the island and go to uh, Bonifacio, um, <clears throat> which is which has been nicknamed the picturesque capital uh, by the author Antoine Pasquin. So Bonifacio is renowned for its limestone limestone cliff uh, that are quite high and quite impressive. Uh, some houses were built directly on the edge. That on the edge. Let me show you. Uh, if the picture wants to appear, maybe, maybe now. Yes. So like, yeah, here is Bonifacio over here. So as you can see, some of the buildings were actually set uh, almost at the very edge of the, of the cliff. So I guess that if you live over there, you shouldn't be afraid of heights, which I am. So I guess it's not a place to, to live for me, but I could definitely visit the city for a few days. <clears throat> so while uh, in Bonifacio, uh, you can take the King of Aragon stairway and the 189 steps that lead to the top with a great view of the cliffs and Sardinia. So uh, an Italian island located right uh, south of Corsica, very close. <clears throat> Um, mm -hmm. So the fortress uh, of the banner is the highest bastion in France. It's 25 meters high. And you can find over there some underground rooms uh, that are partly dug in the cliffs, uh, where you can find some uh, exhibitions about the history of the fortifications uh, over a thousand years. There are some gardens as well that you can go to. And once again, you will have a beautiful view uh, over the port that you can see over here and the cliffs on the other side. So the bastion is actually this huge construction over here on the picture that uh, overlooks the, the ports. <clears throat> and in Bonifacio, there are more than 20 beaches of fine sand and wild creeks. So as you can guess, diving, snorkeling, sailing, kayaking, and all the uh, sailing activities that you can think of are quite popular activities in the area. And then you can end your visit by uh, going to the Filitosa prehistoric site. Uh, so it was discovered in 1946 by Charles Antoine Cesari, who owned uh, the land. And so one day he went there to, uh, I guess, mow the lawn or something like that and uh, discovered this uh, weird statue. So uh, he met with some archaeologists and one of them, Roger Grosjean, 
decided to uh, excavate the site in 1954. So this site was mainly occupied, occupied uh, during the Bronze Age. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> between 2000 to 800 uh, BC. Uh, so you can also find uh, underground an archaeological museum that opened in 2021 uh, with exhibitions of objects that were found on the site from as early as the Neolithic era uh, to the Middle Ages. Uh, so the Filitosa prehistoric site is actually the largest center of statuary art in Corsica. Over there, you can find 13 statue menhir, which you can see on the picture over there. So these kind of sculptures. Um, so they, these are megalithic monuments in granite uh, that are like yeah, kind of human forms. Um, so the function of the statues is still mysterious to that day. Uh, it might be religious, it, they can be space markers, many interpret interpretations are possible and uh, not all archaeologists agree uh, about the main functions. Uh, of those statues. It could be like just pure works of art, but it could have some uh, uses as well. So some of those statue menhirs were actually not located on this precise, precise, size, uh, precise site uh, when they were found. Uh, some of them were ac actually located in uh, some other uh, further villages, but that are not too far. So they were brought to this site to uh, bring them all together. And uh, the site is labeled historic monuments. Uh, so there are quite a few festivals organized in Corsica. Uh, among them, I'm going, uh, I'm going to tell you more about four of them, starting with the Festilumi, uh, which is a three-day festival that happened uh, early July in the Citadel. Uh, in uh, <clears throat> in Bonifacio, so twenty or so light installations showcase Bonifacio's heritage in a new way, with like monumental projections visible at night at night from the port and the fortress of the Banner, uh, with as well poetic perform performances. So you have an idea with the um, with the posters. So like it's mostly light projections uh, on the bastion walls uh, that you can see from all over the city. The Guitar Nights Festival is a one-week festival that happens mid-July in Patrimonio, in the north part of Corsica. It showcases French and international musicians and singers with an emphasis on uh, guitar, as you can imagine. Uh, the Napoleonic Days uh, happen in, Aja in Ajaccio a couple of days mid-August, actually right now, uh, to celebrate Napoleon's birthday as he was born in uh, August 15th, 1769. Uh, so during those uh, celebrations, so you can attend art performances, shows, talks, movie screenings, parades, um, and games that pay tribute to uh, Napoleon. So there are some shows where people wear uh, imperial costume, like soldier costume, some, um, like, yeah, some shows, uh, so not, with a costume not from the court, but then definitely from the uh, 18th century. And then the Iroko Festival, uh, so the Conference of Arabic Cinemas from Yesterday and Today, uh, so organizes workshops and screenings of movies, either shot in Middle East, North Africa, or Berber communities, all by people from this area, these areas. Uh, so the main program is uh, ha usually happens in Ajaccio for three days in November, but then there's a nomadic festival uh, all across Corsica. And for the foodies, so Corsica is home of quite a few uh, specialty foods. Uh, so a lot of charcuterie actually, including prezutu, which is a kind of raw ham made of a specific species of pigs that are raised only in Corsica. Uh, Corsica is also a place where you can find a lot of uh, you and goat cheeses, including brochu, 
uh, that can be made with both goat and ewe milks. Uh, it's actually the most popular cheese in Corsica and it's considered their national cheese. Uh, then for dessert or just an afternoon snack, you can try canistrelli, uh, which is which are sweet biscuits uh, made since the Middle Ages, actually, uh, when they were blessed and distributed on Monday Thursday. Uh, they are made with wheat flour, sugar, and white wine, and you can add raisins, anise seeds, or lemon. And as well, you can uh, try the falculele, which is a typical dessert of Corsica made of brochu, uh, egg yolk, and sugar that are baked on chestnut leaves. Uh, so chestnut is actually um, a very common tree in Corsica. So yeah, that's the end of today's presentation and that's the end of the whole session. So I hope that you enjoy the program and thank you uh, again for uh, for all your support and, you, and your comments. So I'm going to answer your questions. So let's see, do you recommend a French tool company? Uh, so actually I... I don't know more about I don't know much about French stores, uh, especially from the US. Um, but that's something I could maybe dig into. Uh, let's see. I could uh, if you send an email to uh, ref staff uh, to the ref staff, I could maybe try to look that up for you. Uh, but uh, right now, on the top of my head, I can't think of uh, a couple of um, operating tours that would offer some big trips in France. But that's definitely something that I can look up. Uh, what is the movie with the castle called? So there were three. So there was Jacques Rouleau Croquant, and there was one that you could find at the library. Let me find my notes again. Um, da -da 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 -da. Which one was it? Uh, ah, yeah, Brotherhood of the Wolf. So that's the one uh, that we have uh, at the library uh, on DVD. Uh, I can actually type it here. Um, yes. So yeah, thank you very much for your kind comments. And like, yeah, if you want to watch them again, uh, you can watch the videos on YouTube. And thank you again for all your kind words and your feedback. I'm sure that uh, it might be the kind of program that maybe the library will uh, reiterate in the future, especially if like yeah, it, it received a, a nice uh, a nice feedback. So yeah, thank you very much, everyone. I'm not going to say see you next week, but like yeah, you can you can watch me on YouTube and you can come say hi at the library. Thank you so much. And so, yes, if you think about more questions to ask, uh, once again, you can uh, write an email to refstaff at princetonlibrary.org. Let me uh, write it over there. And you can call the information desk. And my, if it's not me who answers the phone, uh, my colleagues can definitely transmit me your comments or questions. Uh, and if it's me, I can try to answer you as best as I can. And so, yeah, I try to finish this presentation with a very French touch with like saucisson, cheese and baguette, which I'm looking forward to find again as I'm traveling to France next week. So, yeah, really looking forward to, to the food part. <laughs> all right. I wish you all a very good day. And yeah, don't hesitate to reach out to me if you want. <laughs>